Good morning, Full Life Church. How's everybody doing this morning? You guys glad to be in church? Anybody glad to be in church today? Man, it's been a powerful time of worship already. I want to just want to thank you, those of you that are here for the first time. We hope you felt right at home already. I've got to meet some of you, and it was a pleasure meeting you. And so it's just an honor for you to be here today. Can you guys do me a favor? Can you help us welcome our online audience? We want to thank you for, for tuning in today. Those of you that are watching us online, we know that you've already experienced the presence of God in your place where, like we have in the room. So it's, it's a great day. And, and anybody glad for sunshine? Man, I'm so glad to see that. What's that yellow ball up, up in the sky, you know? It's been, it's been so amazing just the last couple of days just to enjoy being outdoors. And it's just, I just love just seeing what God, how, how the master artist at work, amen? God is so good. And so we're starting a new series today called Jesus Is. And here's the reason we're doing it now. The timing is, is always intentional. I mean, you know what's coming up in about six weeks. You guys know what Easter is, right? Everybody knows Easter. What a powerful moment we have. An op- I call it an opportunity for all of us as followers of Jesus who call Full Life Church home to really focus our attention on people who are far from God. Does anybody else have a burden for people who are far from God? The rest of you don't have a burden for people who are far from God? Folks, we're talking about serious business here. We're talking about heaven, hell stuff. And I get it, no. So, okay, pastor, way to, way to put a damper on the... On the, on the the service, but folks, this is the reality, folks. There are people that you rub shoulders with in day in and day out. If they were to die today, they would not go to heaven. Let that sink for a second. Folks, I didn't do that to make you feel bad. I do it to inspire you and to realize, you need to realize this, that the message that you carry, that Jesus came lived a sinless life, died a cruel death on the cross, and walked out of the tomb is the most powerful and transformational message on the planet. Amen. So when you feel burdened down with life's worries and cares, be reminded that the same God who walked out of the tomb is in control. Amen. So this Jesus Sees series that we're starting today is all about you and I, first of all, having a revelation of who Jesus is understanding who he is and why he came. Folks, he changed the course of history with that one event. Amen? And so we're going to talk about that the next few weeks. We're going to talk about this idea of Jesus is. And here's the idea behind it. It's not so much about a head knowledge, because many of you have been in church for a long time. You probably have heard a lot of messages about Jesus, probably more than you, you, know, you could even count. And so I, I'm not, it's not my desire to fill you with more information, right? No, what we want is we want transformation. We want it to go from here to here. Amen. And that's exactly what the gospel is. That's the reason Christ came, was to transform you from the inside out so you're no longer the same person that you used to be. Here's how I know it. Here's what Jesus said in John chapter 15. Here's what he said. Now this, now everybody say eternal life. That you, that you what? Know who? Well, know God and Jesus Christ. So this is a part of a prayer that Jesus is praying to his Father about us. Right? About you and I who are followers of Jesus. And what's his prayer for you? That you know him. And this word know, it's not an informational term. It's a relational term. As a matter of fact, it's, very, it's a very intimate term. It's the exact same word in the, in the original language that it, when, it, when a man and a, wa- and a, hu- a wife, they, they go together. If you, you understand what I'm saying. It's a very intimate term. And so what's the idea? Jesus wants you to know him, not just know him. Does that make sense? And so this, I, this whole series is all about that, that you will know your Savior and your Master, your Lord Jesus Christ. And the, the truth is, if we know him better, whatever society says about him, whatever people say about him, we know because we've experienced his presence. We've experienced the life-changing presence of Jesus. 
And we know what the Scripture says. The Scripture says that I've come that you might have life and have it to the full. Because when you know Jesus, you have full life. Amen. So I want to start with a, a, a story out of the New Testament. Jesus is taking his disciples to a, a very, listen, a very dark place. It's called Caesarea Philippi. This is where pagan worship is like king, right? And so in this backdrop of such darkness, of all kinds of evil going on, he asks these questions of his disciples, okay? So I want to pick up there, Matthew chapter 16. I want you to watch what he says. When Jesus came to the region of Caesarea Philippi, he asked his disciples one question, all right? It's the first question. Who do people say the Son of Man is? Here's their answer. Some, they replied, some say John the Baptist, others Elijah, and still others Jeremiah or one of the prophets. And then he asked the second question. Watch this. But what about you? Who do you say I am? And Peter, you guys know who Peter is, right? Watch what he says. Simon Peter answered, definitely, clearly, you are the Messiah, the Son of the living God. And then he says, next verse, Jesus replied, blessed are you, Simon, son of Jonah, for this was not real, revealed to you by flesh and blood, but by my Father in heaven. And I tell you that you are Peter, and on this rock I will build my church, and the gates of Hades will not overcome it. So folks, as we're talking about this idea of who Jesus is, there's two questions. Who do people say he is? You've heard some things, right? Oh, he's a good prophet. He was a good teacher, but he wasn't God. Anybody heard that? The next question is, but who do you say he is? See, you can't go on somebody else's decision, right? you got to make one. you got to form your own decision about who Christ is. And the beauty of this is, if, you'll, if you're open to it, as, as he did for Peter, the Father will reveal to you who Jesus is. Are you all with me this morning? And so this is the idea that I, I pray for you. I, my prayer for you is that you get this revelation of who Christ is. That it's, that it's not just, hey, I know, I know what the scripture says about him. But no, I've experienced his presence. I've experienced the life change that come from placing my faith in his finished work. And I'm never the same. Does anybody have that testimony in here? That you're not the same since you've experienced Christ. This is the reason why the next few weeks... We're going to talk about who Jesus is. That's the why. So now what I want to do is, I want you to go with me to 1 Corinthians chapter 2 and verse 1 and 2. Here's another thing I want you to consider. You'll remember, friends, that when I first came to you, this is Paul talking, in, the, in, in God's sheer genius, I didn't try to impress you with polished speeches and the latest philosophy. I deliberately kept it, what? Plain and simple first. Here's the first thing. Jesus and who he is, and then what? What he did, Jesus crucified. Pretty simple, huh? I love it because Jesus was, had, always had this way of taking these complex things and putting them on the bottom shelf for you and I to understand, right? I'm not the brightest tool in the shed or the sharpest tool in the shed, but I can understand the fact that Christ came and died for my sins, amen? And so... This is the whole gist of this is that we want to understand why, who he is and why he came. So let's take a look at, if you're taking notes, I want you to look at me, with me. First of all, you've got to understand that the Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, testify of this truth that Jesus is God. You want to look, at, they want to look with me? John chapter 20, verse 31 this is John. Remember, John has, is one of the 12 disciples. He's one of the original 12. And he was one of, actually, we'll say this. He's actually part of Jesus' inner circle of three. Right? He had his 12, but he also had his inner circle. John was one of those. And here's what he says about, in his gospel, about what, who Jesus is. But these are written that you may believe that Jesus is what? The Messiah, the 
Son of God, and that by believing you may have life in his name. Now you notice he didn't just say that by belief, you may just believe. What does he say? He takes it a step further and says that you may have life in his name. John was saying, here's the whole gospel that I've written. Here's the thesis behind the gospel of John, that you believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. But not only will you believe it, but it'll transform you and give you full life. Does that make sense? So here we are, folks. We're faced with this decision of who Jesus is, and we're gaining more and more evidence through the Scriptures that He truly is who He says He is, God. So this statement sums up everything about what we're going to be talking about the next few weeks, that you can have this promised life in Christ. If you're in this room today and you don't know Him, man, i got good news for you. Before you leave today, you can just more than know Him here. You can know him here. Amen? Let's continue. In, in, God, in John's gospel, chapter 1, the very first chapter, you'll notice that he kind of patterns this first chapter after the very first book of the Bible, right? So he says, in the beginning. Why is he saying that? Because he wants you to understand that Jesus didn't just exist the moment he was born in Bethlehem. No, he existed from eternity past. And that's important for you to understand. Because of the claim that he made. And here's what he says. In the beginning was the Word. And the Word was with God. And the Word. Everybody say that. The Word. That is so crucial for you to understand. And then it says. He was with God in the beginning. Through him all things were made. That's crucial to understand too. Without him nothing was made that has been made. And here, watch this. In him was life. Everybody say life. Are y'all following this trend? Everywhere Jesus is, what happens? Come on, somebody, help me with this. Wherever where Jesus is, what happens? What kind of life? Full life. In him was life, and that life was the light of all mankind. Folks, this gospel message that you have, that you carry as a follower of Jesus, is powerful to dispel darkness. That's why it's called light. If, you were, if we were to turn out all the lights in this room, and, and all of us held up flashlights, what would happen in this room? The darkness would be dispelled. It would no longer be dark in here, would it? Can you imagine... The body of Christ being the light of the world across the world, what could happen? Come on, somebody, help me with here. We could push back this evil that we're seeing in our world today. Amen. Now, I want you to follow me. We're going to skip down to verse 14, same chapter. John chapter 1, I want you to watch this. And the word became, what did he do? And he's made his dwelling among us. Remember, the word is God. Of course, the word is Jesus, right? We have seen his glory, the glory of the one and only Son who came from the Father full of grace and truth. So, not only did he exist at the beginning with God, John declares that he is God, but he also had the authority and was responsible for everything that you see. We look out and we see the the oceans, we see rivers, we see mountains, we see rivers carving through mountains. All of this at the command of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Why? Because He is, say it with me, God. The Scriptures testify of who He is. This is so important for us, folks, to get this, that the Scriptures Bear witness to the fact that Jesus is God. And here's the reason. This is, this is probably the meatiest part of this message. So if you remember the Old Testament, if you've, ever, if you've ever studied the Old Testament, you know that there was an old system of sacrifice. You guys familiar with that? Where once a year, a priest would go into what we call the Holy of Holies. It was a, it was a tent that they set up to worship God and to sacrifice 
And once a year, a priest would go into this place called the Holy of Holies. Only he could go in there, and only once a year. And he, you know what he would do? He would offer sacrifices for the sins. Not only his sins, because he, he was flesh and blood, but the sins of all those children of Israel. The truth is, it had to happen every year because the blood, of goat, the blood of goats and animals would not take care of the problem. The sin kept emerging. But folks, something happened. Jesus became flesh. Became a human because only God, who's perfect, sinless, could pay a once and for all penalty for your sins. Come on, somebody. Because you remember, the lamb had to be spotless. It had to be perfect. It couldn't have any defect, folks. The only way that you and I could get our sins forgiven from now and eternity is that a perfect sacrifice be made. Guess what? God said, I'll take it for you. I'll put on flesh. I'll die on the cross. I'll walk out of the tomb so you and I could have freedom this morning. Amen. Are you following this? So it, there's no other way. There's no other way this could have happened. Jesus had to be God in the flesh so he could pay that penalty for you, so he could be that lamb for you. Anybody thankful for that this morning? This is why, folks, Jesus can't be just a good prophet, just a good teacher. He had to be the incarnation of God on the earth so he could pay that penalty. And the scriptures bear witness because here's what Jesus, John the Baptist, Jesus' first cousin, said. First John, I mean John chapter 1 verse 29 says, the next day John saw Jesus coming toward him and said, everybody read this with me, look, the Lamb of God who takes away the what? The sin of the world. Is anybody glad for that? Can we give him praise this morning? He is the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. Boy, this is crucial. Remember the question. Who do men say that I am? But the most important one is, who do you say I am? So the scriptures bear witness that he is God. Can you acknowledge today, folks, that Jesus can and does have the power to take away your sin? Here's the second thing if you're taking notes. Folks, you would expect God to be able to heal the sick, right? To raise the dead. If he truly is God, wouldn't you expect that? He has all power. Wouldn't you expect that he could control the elements, that he could forgive sin? I've got good news for you. Jesus did all that. Didn't he? If you look at the scriptures in, in the New Testament, we're going to read some. He healed the sick. Matthew chapter 8, verses 14 and 15. Peter's, Peter's mother-in-law is sick with a fever. And watch what Jesus does. Go back, verse 14. We'll read it together. There we go. Thank you. Give those guys a hand back there. They're good. When Jesus came into Peter's house, he saw Peter's mother-in-law lying in the bed with a fever. He touched her, her hand, and the fever, what? Left her. And she got up and began to wait on him. Folks, that's just one story of many in the New Testament where Jesus spoke or touched somebody and they were instantly made whole. Would you expect God to be able to heal the sick? Is Jesus God? Check the box. You guys that are list and checkers, can y'all check the box with me? Y'all with me? Come on, somebody. Here's the second one. Would you expect Jesus to be able to raise the dead if he's God? Mark chapter 5, verse 40. You guys probably have heard this story. Jairus' daughter is sick. She, they go to Jesus and say, hey, this, this man's daughter is sick, and he, he didn't get there right away. And so what happens is she ends up dying. Watch this. And then he goes. But they laughed at him. Why? Because he, told, he had said, look, she's, not, she's asleep. 
They're like, she's not asleep, she's dead. Watch this. After he put them all out, he took the child's fa father and mother and the disciples who were with him and went in where the child was. He took her by the hand and said to her, Talitha kum, which means little girl, I say to you, get up immediately. Everybody say immediately. The girl stood up and began to walk around. She was 12 years old. At this, they were completely astonished. Can you put yourself in that room? How many of you would have been astonished? My jaw would have been at the floor. Would you expect Jesus or would you expect God to be able to heal the sick and raise the dead? Check. Number three. The elements would obey him. What do I mean by that? The wind, the waves, the sea. Mark chapter 4, verse 39. His disciples are in a boat. They're scared. They're worried because a storm brews up in that, on, the, on the Sea of Galilee. And the, boy, they're just they're panicking. And what, is, what does Jesus do? He's, he was taking a nap, by the way. Wouldn't you expect God to not have to worry about a storm? Was anybody worried Friday night? Y'all weren't worried? I have to admit, I was. So we're, I, was, I went to get my hair cut, and I saw this come over the screen. Uh, there's a tornado warning in the Cherokee County. I'm like, okay. So I get home, and folks, I, I, I kid you not, to God be the glory, I was pulling into my subdivision, and this tree falls on the power line just almost right over me. You talk about scared? I whip in into the, the, the subdivision. I immediately go upstairs, turn on the TV. And, you know, again, the, the guys from ABC, from Channel 2 News are saying, hey, if you live near Holly Street, take cover. So here's the thing. I'm, he's going to kill me. <laughs> Lori's in the bathtub. I said, Lori, get out of the bathtub and get downstairs with me right now. She just kind of saunters around uh, down the steps. And I'm like, you don't take this serious enough. Maybe she had, the, maybe she had Jesus kind of faith. More faith than I had. I know that right now. So anyway, what does he say to the storm? Can y'all put that, that scripture back up there for me? Mark chapter. He got up. What did he do? He rebuked the wind and said to the waves, What? quiet do you see the authority in that voice not hey would you please stop no what was it quiet be still then the wind died down and it was completely calm would you expect god to be able to speak to the winds and the waves with authority and say quiet be still did jesus do it Check the box. He healed the sick. He raised the dead. He spoke to the elements and they obeyed. Oh, pastor, all you got's that old religious book, that, that mystical book. I'm here to tell you, folks, I don't, I don't know what you believe about the Bible, but I'm here to tell you, if you're looking at it from a historical point of view, it's one of the most accurate, documented books on the planet. And so if you can trust its historicity, you can trust what it says. And what does it say? It says Jesus is God. It says Jesus healed the sick. It said Jesus raised the dead. It said Jesus calmed the storm. Amen. What do you believe about him? Remember, that's the question. Turn to your ears and say, ask him, what do you believe about Jesus? Come on, go ahead right now, ask him. Here's the last one. Forgiveness of sin. Would you expect God? To be able to heal and forgive sin. Amen. Guess what? He did. Let's read it together. Matthew chapter 9 verse 2. And then I'm going to show you a clip from this story out of The Chosen. I want you to, we're going to watch this just a second. So men brought him to a paralyzed man lying on a mat. When Jesus saw their faith, he said to the man, take heart, son. What does he say? Is that interesting that he says... He doesn't say you're healed. What does he say? He's making a statement, folks. 
loud and clear, before I heal this guy, you need to know who I am. Come on, somebody. And then he says, at this, some of the teachers of the law said to themselves, this fellow is blasphemy. Why? Because they knew in their heart, they knew they'd been taught all their lives who could forgive sin. Only God could forgive sin. And yet this man is forgiving sin. I love this, knowing their thoughts. He read their mind. Jesus said, why do you entertain evil thoughts in your hearts? Which is easier to say, your sins are forgiven, or to say, get up and walk. And then watch this. But I want you to know that the Son of Man has, everybody say authority, to forgive sin. So he said to the paralyzed man, get up, take your mat, and go home. Watch this video. Jesus of Nazareth!
And isn't that powerful? So, you healed the sick, right? You raised the dead. You spoke to the elements and they obeyed. You forgave sin. Who do you say he is this morning? Is he the Christ, the Son of the living God? Folks, the, the Scriptures testify that Jesus is... Help me out one more time. The, tri- the Scriptures testify that Jesus is... All right, you guys are good. The third thing here, Jesus himself claimed to be God, right? John 8, chapter, 50, uh, chapter 8, verse 58 and 59 Verily, truly, I tell you, Jesus answered before Abraham was born. Everybody say it. I am. Verse 59. At this, they picked up stones to stone him, but Jesus hid himself, slipping away from the temple grounds. Now, did Jesus come right out and say, I am God? No. But everybody around there understood when he said that phrase, I am. Because their minds wander back to a desert and an experience with Moses and a burning bush. And Moses asked God, who is it that's going to send me? And he said, tell them, I am, that I am will send you. So they knew beyond the shadow of a doubt that Jesus was claiming to be God by that one statement. Why do you think they picked up stones? They they were accusing him of blasphemy, of claiming to be equal with God. So the evidence is there, folks. I could go numerous passages just in the book of John. Every time Jesus said, I am, he's telling the world, I am God. So here's what C.S. Lewis said about Jesus. A man who was merely a man and said the sort of things Jesus said wouldn't be a great moral teacher. He'd either be a lunatic on the level with a man who says he's a poached egg or else he'd be the devil of hell. You must make your choice. Either this man was and is the son of God or else a madman or something worse. And then he goes on to say this, same guy. If they could put that other quote up there for me. If they don't have it, I'll read it from here. I've got it in my notes. You must make your choice. Either this man was and is the Son of God, or else a madman or something worse. You can shut him up for a fool. You can spit at him and kill him as a demon, or you can fall at his feet and call him Lord and God. But let us not come with any patronizing nonsense about his his being a great human, a great human teacher. He has not left that open to us. He did not intend to. Folks, who do men say that I am? Who do you say I am? The most controversial thing that Jesus said about himself was found in John chapter 4, 14, verse 6. And here's what he says. I am the way and the truth and the life. What does he say? No one comes to the Father except through me. There's a lot in that statement, isn't there? First of all, you see the I am. It's there. Secondly, He's saying that he is the only way to eternal life. Folks, that's the the main thing that puts Christianity in odds in our society. Because we're in a society that says, it doesn't matter what you believe. All roads get to heaven. Anybody ever heard that? But here's my... Here's my rebuttal of that. If he's truly God, doesn't he have the right to have it that way? Secondly, wouldn't the God of all wisdom know the best path 
for fulfillment and eternal life while you're here on earth. And so what I'm challenging you to do is to see this from a different lens. Because people see Jesus saying that as narrow-minded. But think about it this way. Think of it as an invitation into a life that none of the other religions can deliver on. Because again, if he's truly God, wouldn't he know fully what life looks like? Wouldn't he know the path to your fulfillment? Remember, and here's the other thing that that makes it so challenging because the thing that differentiates Christianity from all other religions is all other religions say this, if you do enough good, if you work hard enough, if you go to this many, uh, you know, if you say this many prayers a day or if you do, do this many good deeds a day, then maybe you're in right standing with God. How many would choose that way? As opposed to what Christianity says. The work. Lean in to this. The work has already been done 2,000 years ago when Jesus said it is finished on the cross. Which means you and I, we don't have to work for our salvation. The, the, The scripture says it's by grace through faith that you have been saved. Not of works lest any man should boast. So if he says, I'm the way, the truth, and the life, and he's God, isn't that the best way? Isn't that the only way? And the beauty of this, folks, is, like I said, other religions can't deliver on this. They can't set you free. But there's one. The same God who calmed the storm, who healed the sick, who raised the dead, can speak life into you today. Amen. Can we celebrate that this morning? That's his ability. That's his authority. Listen, you got to understand this, folks. Everything that we see here, if he's God, he has all power and all authority. So when we drill it down to your personal situation, the very things that you're facing right now, the very struggles, the very uncertainties that you're facing right now, the very fears, the anxieties, the worries, Jesus Christ has the authority and can and will speak life and peace into your situation this very moment. Maybe you're facing that storm. I'm not talking about a literal thunderstorm. I'm talking about the storms of life. Can he say peace be still to your storm? If he's God, he absolutely has the authority to do that. In closing, we we have the same set of questions set before us that was set before Peter and the disciples at Caesarea Philippi. The same set of questions that C.S. Lewis said, right? Make your choice. Who do men say that I am? And then, who do you say I am? What's your response to this message today? Number one, acknowledge Acknowledge what the scriptures say. What do they say? Truly, Jesus is God. Number two, acknowledge the credibility that came when Jesus did the miracles, when he raised the dead, when he, when he suffered, when he successfully said, peace be still to the waves. What was he saying? What was he proving? I'm God. Number three, Acknowledge that Jesus made this claim. It was not even, it was no, there was no chance that you could not know that he is saying about himself, I am God. I'm going to skip number four because I want to use that as the last one. 
Number five, experience the relationship you were created for with Christ. You notice I said relationship. You notice I didn't say religion. And then tell others about this wonderful relationship they can have with Christ. Because remember what I said earlier. When you got it here, you can't help but to tell it. What has Jesus done for you? What was your life like before Christ? What's it like now? Because Jesus, that baby's testifying out of the mouths of babes. Out of the mouths of babes, right? Would you stand this morning? Thank you for joining us for this week's service. We pray that God has used this moment to greatly impact your life. We invite you to live fully alive in Christ with us here at Full Life Church. We'll see you next week.